Welcome back, brothers and sisters, uh, to these spiritual exercises. Today, we are going to have a meditation on the mystery of the transfiguration. So let us, without any further ado, enter into the presence of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our opening prayer. Lord, grant me the grace that all my intentions, actions, and operations be purely ordered to the service and praise of your divine majesty. Lord, my God, I also offer to you all my thoughts, affections, desires, acts, dryness, struggles, etc., that with all of them I may give you greater glory, be converted, and save my soul. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The composition of the prayer is the story of the transfiguration as found in the Gospel of Matthew. If you prefer another one, you can find it in the other Gospels, but we are going to use this one from the Gospel of St. Matthew. Uh, this is chapter 17, beginning on verse 17, easy to remember. Matthew 17, 17. The transfiguration. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain apart. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah, talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is well that we are here. If you wish, I will make three booths here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, when lo, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were filled with awe. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. The Gospel of the Lord. So our second uh, petition is, O oh Lord, grant me the grace to contemplate you in this mystery, that I may know your will, that I may follow you wholeheartedly, that I may serve you better, that I may love you more deeply and follow you, and, and that I may become a saint. And I pray this in your name, Jesus, our Lord. Amen. So, pause the video. Uh, Prepare yourself to enter into the body of the meditation uh, when you come back and complete your 10 minutes of preparation and thinking about this story and the setting of the transfiguration of the Lord. I welcome back uh, to this body of the meditation. And I'm going to base this meditation or the points on um, homily uh, by St. Augustine on the Transfiguration. And this is, um, this goes on like this. On the words of the Gospel, Matthew 17, he says, After six days, Jesus take with him, took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, etc. So he's uh, commenting on this passage of the Gospel. Uh, the first point that he makes is that Jesus fulfills his prophecy. When he said, Truly, truly, I say to you, there are some standing here, we shall not taste death until they see the Son of Man in his kingdom. That's uh, from Matthew uh, 16, 28, is the previous chapter to this part of the transfiguration. So Peter and James and John were those some which shall not taste death until they see the Son of Man in his kingdom. So it was a foretaste. Of course, the kingdom is ultimately is heaven. But uh, this transfiguration was a foretaste for them to witness uh, Jesus in his glory and is in his kingdom. Uh, so it, this is then uh, a fulfillment. It is a small fulfillment and anticipation on what is to come later, uh, as I said, ultimately in heaven. And then and it's another fulfillment also uh, in the church, which is the kingdom of, of heaven on earth. Now, the kingdom of heaven 
is the kingdom of the saints. Uh, this is what St. Augustine says. Their sound is gone out through all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. Uh, that's from Psalm 19. It says the kingdom of heaven is in his apostles and all who preach the word of God with faithfulness. So here St. Augustine is saying that this coming of the kingdom of heaven, the foretaste was the transfiguration. The ultimate fulfillment is heaven, of course, but now, it is the church. The church is the kingdom of God manifested in time and in place, in space. And it is, as St. Augustine says, is the kingdom of heaven is where his apostles, his disciples are. And all those who are called to preach the word of God with all faithfulness. The second point that we can dwell in this meditation, in this during this time is the splendor of Jesus. The Lord Jesus himself shone bright as the sun. His raiment became white as snow and Moses and Elijah talk with him. And in other gospels, it says they talk with him about his coming passion, his exodus uh, that he was to accomplish in Jerusalem. But Matthew doesn't mention that. But then we can we can think about Jesus and how he showed himself to the apostles in this event of the transfiguration. Jesus says John in, in the first chapter, Jesus is the light which enlightens everyone that comes into the world. Every human person, whether they are Christian or they or they are not, every human person has the light of Jesus within their hearts. It is the universal call of all human beings to seek God. So Jesus is the light explicitly or implicitly that shines in the heart of every human being. So what this sun is to the eyes of the human flesh, that is he to the eyes of the human heart. We see Jesus, when he is resplendent with glory, is like a like a sun, like like the sun that we see in the heavens, and and this this brilliance that shines on us is like the brilliant of Jesus to the eyes of the human heart. Um, now, uh, Saint Saint Augustine continues. You know, he says, now his raiment is his church, for. If the raiment be not held together by him who puts it on, it will fall off. As that woman which suffered from an issue of blood, when she had touched the Lord's border was made whole, so the church which came out from the Gentiles was made whole by the preaching of St. Paul the Apostle. Also the prophet Isaiah says, Though your sins be as scarlet, I will make them white as snow. So uh, St. Augustine says in this um, clothes of Jesus that became so white and so radiant, he sees the church and that it is held together by he himself, by his own power, and that he made it pure, he made it immaculate uh, because of his sacrifice. So we, he, we see that this bright uh, garment that Jesus shows is the church herself. And we can, uh, we can see also that we as church, as his disciples, we are called to be that light for other people in the world, light of the world. And not to lose uh, this light, not to lose our connection with Jesus, because it is only through our connection with Jesus that we are capable of becoming light in the world, light in this world of darkness. And then also he says, and he mentions the woman that had the issue of blood that was healed by touching the garment of Jesus. This can also be an image of those people who reaching out for the church are able to touch the very power of Jesus and be made whole uh, by the preaching of the church, but also by the, its ministry of holiness, which is when the church administers the sacraments to us. Now the vision continues and they see Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets. And St. Augustine asks, what avail they except that they converse with the Lord, except they give witness to the Lord who would read the law of the prophets? Mark how briefly the apostle expresses this. For by the law is the knowledge of sin, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. Behold the son, 
being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Behold the shining of the sun, the sun or the sun, you know, Jesus, of course. Uh, so here uh, we see, of course, Moses represents the law. Elijah represents the prophetic tradition of the Jewish uh, people. And the main point is that they are conversing with the Lord and they are, in the law and in the prophets, they are giving witness to Jesus. They foretold about Jesus. And now Jesus is the fulfillment of all what they had said in the law and in the prophets. Now he mentions, uh, St. Augustine mentions this passage from St. Paul, where he says that the knowledge, the law, by the law, we came to know sin. Uh, and then now the righteousness of God is manifested in Jesus. I, I'm kind of paraphrasing because I don't have the scripture right in front of me. But the point is that uh, uh, the Lord gave us the Ten Commandments and he revealed there that what we had already inscribed in our hearts by the natural law, but that was kind of blurry because of our sins. So he gave us the, the Ten Commandments and he spelled out what his expectations are from us. Uh, that we may lead a life that is holy in his presence. But then St. Paul would explain that we realize that we are unable to fulfill the law, that we fall short all the time, that we sin over and over, and, and that even though the law gives us then the knowledge that we are sinners, the knowledge that we cannot fulfill the will of God in our lives, then the, uh, there is a passage in the, in the letter to the Romans where St. Paul says, you know, I see the law and it's something that I want to do, but I cannot do it. And I see sin and it's something that I don't want to do, but that's what I end up doing. And then he says, poor, poor me, miserable of me. Who's going to free me from this body that drags me uh, to commit sin? And then he answers himself, you know, thanks be to God for Jesus Christ, our Savior. And that is the point of Christianity. It's not that we have greater commandments or more exacting laws or more demands on us, which we do, by the way, is the, the highest moral standard in the world, the Christian life, uh, if, we, if we really aspire to live it out. And... Um, <clears throat> So it's not only that we have the most exacting laws or demands on us because of our faith, but it is because it gives us the grace to actually do the will of God, to fulfill the commandments and to fulfill the expectations that Jesus places on us through his teachings. And that is the difference with all other religions. Every religion has moral codes. Christianity has the highest, the most developed moral code in, in, in the world. And but not the, no other religion give people the, the, the ability or the power to fulfill those demands as does Christianity. Through the sacraments we receive, Jesus, we receive his power and this power, the Holy Spirit, enables us to fulfill God's will in our lives. Yeah, of course we are sinners. Of course we fail. Of course we are many times unfaithful to our call as Christians, but nevertheless, the grace is available to us and we need but go to Jesus to receive this grace and become saints. So there is no excuse. There is no excuse. Yes, we are weak. There's, yes, we are sinners. They, yes, we are a work in progress, but the grace is there and we can do it. We can become saints. So when Peter sees this image of Jesus with Moses and Elijah, and he realizes this is glorious, this is wonderful. Uh, it was a foretaste of heaven, so to speak. And of course, he didn't want to leave. <laughs> you know. And then he says, um, Lord, it is good that we are here. And uh, he was perhaps very much uh, wearied by the ministry, by the all the people that were about them all the time. And, and he had gone to this place of solitude in the mountain with Jesus. And then he had this glorious vision. And of course, of course, he wished well for himself. He wanted to stay there. He, he was enjoying the moment. And then, then he, he proposes the Lord his plan, you know, brilliant Peter, you know, let's, let's make three booths or three tents here. Uh, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And of course, we are going to stay with you, right? <laughs> but, um, but then the Lord does not answer Peter, but the answer comes instead from God the Father. 
And then he, when he was still speaking, says the gospel, uh, a bright cloud came and overshadowed them. They were enveloped by this bright cloud. And then the father himself answers Peter in this strange request that he had. And he says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. The point was not that we are going to stay in this beautiful meditation in this beautiful contemplation of Jesus, the point is that we get it, that we know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, is the beloved Son of God, and that the Father is well pleased with him, and that we need to listen to him, meaning we need to obey him, we need to do what he tells us. The Lord himself says, not Everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my father. And that is the that is the, the cornerstone of our faith, is our obedience to Jesus. It's not just giving him lip service, but to actually do what he asks from us. Um, very good. well. So Christ is the word of God. The word of God that was manifested in the law and the word of God that was manifested in the prophets. It's like St. John of the Cross says, Jesus is the definitive word of God, is the, the revelation of, of God. In Jesus is the fullness of God's revelation. And whoever wants to look for something more, is acting like a fool. That's uh, paraphrasing John of the Cross, but that's what he says. Jesus is the pinnacle of God's revelation. And therefore, we need to listen to him, meaning we need to submit ourselves to him and obey him. The third point that we can meditate, which is also from St. Augustine, is about the cloud and the testimony of the Father. The cloud that overshadowed them in, in a way made them is be inside a tabernacle in the presence of God. And then they heard that voice that sounded out of the cloud that revealed the person of Jesus as the beloved son of God, whom we are to obey. So we see Moses is there, Elijah is there, but then uh, St. Augustine points out, Notice that he doesn't say, these are my beloved sons. He says, this is my beloved son, in singular, referring, of course, to Jesus, and in whom he is well pleased. So because we have heard him in the prophets, and we have heard him in the law, but now we have him fully revealed, fully manifested in our midst, in the person of Jesus, our Lord. So is, and then the gospel continues. When they heard this, they fell to the earth. They fell to the ground. And see then, in the church is exhibited to us the kingdom of God. Here is the Lord. Here is the law and the prophets. But the Lord as the Lord. The law in Moses, the prophecy in Elijah, but only they are the servants and the ministers of the Lord. They are vessels. He is the fountain, says St. Augustine in his beautiful style. Moses and the prophets spoke and wrote, but when they poured out, they were filled from him. Whatever came from the law and the prophets came from the superabundance of the word of God, of Jesus Christ himself, the word uh, made flesh. And then the fourth point, only Jesus they saw no man save Jesus only. After the vision had passed and they raised their eyes, everything was gone and they saw only Jesus standing there before them. What does this mean? Asked St. Augustine. When the apostle was being read, you heard, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then we will see face to face. And tongues shall cease when that which we now hope for and believe shall come. Uh, after the death comes the resurrection. After our present life comes eternal life. After the resurrection, what is the law for you? What are prophets for you? We no longer need the law. We no, no, no longer will need the prophets uh, when we are finally in heaven. So neither Moses nor Elijah are seen. Only the, he only remains to you. Who? Jesus. That's, that's, that's the only thing that remains at the end. 
who in the beginning, beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He remains to you. That God may be all in all. Moses and Elijah will be in heaven, of course, but no longer the law or the prophets uh, or the prophecy. Uh, they fulfilled their purpose. They gave witness to Jesus and, and they gave witness also that it was befitting that he should suffer and then rise again from the dead and enter into his glory. So the law and the prophets, they all prophesy the whole life of Jesus and of course his passion, his death, his resurrection. And then, <clears throat> and then these are the promises of Jesus. If we hold on to him in this life, these are his promises. He that loves me shall be loved by my father and I will love him and I will manifest myself to him. This is a great gift. This is a great promise, says St. Augustine. God does not reserve for you as a reward anything that is his own, but he himself. In other words, he is not just giving us a price uh, outside of himself. He himself is the price. He is our goal. He is our heaven. And uh, this uh, Pope Benedict XVI said in one of his addresses, I don't know, I, I don't remember what address, but I, I love this quote from him. He says, we go to heaven to the extent that we go to Jesus Christ and enter into him. Heaven is a person, says uh, Benedict XVI. Jesus himself is what we call heaven. So this word of they saw Jesus alone before them is like them. <laughs> the climax, you know, that, that that's the point. He is the center of the universe, the center of history. He is the essence of what heaven is. Coming down the mountain. That's the next moment in this, um, uh, this story of the transfiguration. Uh, now, now in this life, this is the time when we are supposed to preach the word, to be urgent in season and out of season, to convince, to rebuke, to exhort, be unfailing in patience and in teaching. As for you, always be steady, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. This is St. Paul talking to Timothy, St. Timothy, and giving him instruction. And these are also for us. This is our time to work in the vineyard of the Lord. This is our time to fulfill the mission for which he he put us into this world. And so we need to we need to focus on that. Yes, it's beautiful that the Lord gives us good experiences in prayer, but this is a time to labor in the vineyard of the Lord. Uh, then uh, St. Augustine quotes from the letter, of, uh, the first letter to the Corinthians. He says, love seeks not her own interest or his own interest. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor is the same letter to the Corinthians. Uh, so St. Paul, also said, just as I try to please all men in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, advantage but that of many, that they may be saved. Uh, so this Peter understood not yet when he decided to, to stay on the mountain, of course, but he was reserving this for you, Peter, after your death. You know, this was just a foretaste, but then that was supposed to give you strength and courage and consolation so that you can enter into the labor of building up the kingdom of God on earth. Uh, so let's see, come down to labor in the world, to serve, to be despised and to be crucified, to suffer for me. And that, that is the call of Jesus himself. He gives us a glimpse of heaven. Uh, a glimpse of his promises, what we are going to enjoy after life. But but for now, he's calling us to, to be here on this earth and to fulfill our ministry, to fulfill our, our mission. Uh, the life came down that he might be slain. The bread came down that he might hunger. The way came down that life might be, might be wearied in the way. The fountain came down that he might thirst. Of, of course, the life is Jesus. The bread is Jesus. The way is Jesus. The fountain is Jesus. And he became man and he experienced all this privation as a human being. So uh, Jesus himself being rich became poor for us. He came down from heaven and he was sacrificed for us, the life 
life himself, Jesus is the life. And he who is the living breath come down from heaven, he came and experienced privation, experienced hunger. And he who is the way came down from heaven and he was wearied by walking on all those roads in Galilee. And he who is the fountain of everything that exists came down and he experienced thirst. So, and we, do we refuse to labor? Do we refuse to have charity, to preach the truth so that we may come into his eternity? When it is then when we will find our security. So this is um, all for the body of the meditation. Please come back shortly uh, to, for, to do the conclusive acts, which is the colloquium. Welcome back. Uh, now we are going to have the time of affective prayer, uh, which, as you know already, and I tell you almost every day, is the most important part of your meditation. The time you spend with Jesus, conversing with Jesus and bringing to him your own life. So the first colloquium is uh, with Jesus himself, and you can talk about um, about this mystery of the transfiguration and what impressions this meditation uh, had in your heart, in your mind. And also, you can imagine yourself as being one of the disciples witnessing all this. And you can also perhaps converse with Moses and Elijah, but with Jesus or Peter or anybody in this, in this place. But when you finish talking to Jesus, then you pray the Anima Christi. Then the second colloquium, please uh, talk to the Father and give, ask him for that grace that you may be willing to do God's will with all your heart, that you may fulfill the mission that, that he entrust, entrusted to you when he sent you into this life that you may fulfill his will and become a saint. And then you can end that uh, colloquium, that conversation with the Father uh, by praying the Our Father. And then of course you can do other conversations with Moses, Elijah, Peter, James, uh, John, etc. And at the end of those conversations, if you feel like doing them, then you can ask them, you know, pray for me. You know, say Moses, pray for me. Elijah, pray for me. Saint Peter, Pray, pray for me, St. James, St. John, pray for me. Uh, so go ahead and do your time of effective prayer. So here is the examination of the time of prayer. Uh, first, did you have a good prayer time or did you have a not so good prayer time? Did you pray for the whole hour? Or did you shorten the time of prayer? Do you have a suitable place and time? Do you overcome any difficulties? Are you excessively attached to something? Does this attachment prevent you from making your spiritual exercises well? Or does it uh, prevent you from doing God's will? Have I carried out this spiritual exercise with great enthusiasm and generosity, or at least asked for that grace? Did I experience consolation or desolation? And what do I need to do now? So thank you very much. And please finish your time of prayer with an Our Father, Hail Mary, and Glory Be. And please do say a prayer for me, and I will pray for you as well. So Mary conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. Amen. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.